as Jeff said, Pastor Jeff said that we're starting a new series on the book of Titus. And the theme of the series, the theme, the whole theme is established. And so when you see that with regard to a company, when you see that EST period, what does that tell you? That's when it started, like 1850, it was established. And so really, the Apostle Paul writes to Titus to encourage him to go back and get those churches on the island of Crete established to get them so that they're mature and functioning the way they should be. And really, he writes this letter around 64 A.D. So you could say established 64 A.D. in the sense that the letter was written then for Titus to go to work. Now, we're going to show you some pictures here. And with this weather, this week was crazy weather, right? I mean, we had some rain and cold. And, and you, these are pictures, believe it or not, these are pictures of the island of Crete. Wouldn't you want to just go there right now? If it wasn't so far away, you just go there. It's, it's just a moderate temperature all year round. So as we look at these pictures, go, go, there we go. Man, I'd like to just take off right there. How about that next one? The mountains on the island of Crete go up to about 8,000 feet, right down to those sandy beaches. The island itself is about 156 miles long and 30 miles wide. Look at this map here, and it just shows you where the island of Crete is. It's located south of Greece, not far from Turkey, right in the Mediterranean world. And so Paul is telling Titus, he left him there. They did some work. And Titus has his hands filled. He's got his hands cut out for him. He's got a, really got a big job because the Cretans had a terrible reputation. In fact, in chapter 1, Paul says this. He's quoting their prophet or their poet who wrote in 600 B.C. He says this. One of Crete's own prophets has said, Cretans are always liars, <laughs> Evil brutes and lazy gluttons. In fact, if you were to play the Cretan, that meant that you were trying to out-trick the trickster. That was their reputation. They had a reputation of trying to trick people or trying to lie and being <laughs> brutes. In fact, the same prophet said that the island did not have beasts on it. It didn't need beasts because it had people who acted like wild animals. And so he's, he's telling Titus that you've got to go. You've got to stay there, and you've got to get these churches established. They think at that time there were about 10 different major cities on the island. And so there was a need for him to go into all those cities where those churches were probably meeting in homes and get them where they need to be mature-wise. Appoint elders. Some believe that the believers came into this church probably after Acts chapter 2. What happens at Acts chapter 2? Let's get some feedback. Acts chapter 2, what begins? What is the beginning? What is going on there? Acts chapter 2. That's right. In, in Acts chapter 2, that's when the church starts. And they believe, in fact, you could read for yourself in Acts chapter 2, Cretans were at that first message of the gospel given by Peter, and they believed that the Cretans, there were many Jews who had gone there to the temple, to Pentecost, to worship. They hear the gospel. They probably bring it back with them, and those churches start. So these churches are possibly going for about 30 years. And they needed to be established. They needed to be grounded in their faith. Did you ever have one of those projects? In the back of your mind, you go, ah, oh, I got to get to that. You know, maybe it's, a, maybe it's a problem with your car. You go, oh, the brakes aren't what they should. I know I can hear them grinding. I should have taken care of this. And they're, they're just irritating you. Or the check engine light's on. 
right? And you're going, oh, I got to get this done before the inspection. And, or you're thinking of a house project. Maybe I'll have some confession here. How many have house projects that they haven't? Okay. Yeah, yeah. We, you know what it's like. You look at that and you go, I need to take care of that. That needs to get done. And we, we moved into a house in Kellswater Bridge, and, and my wife said, oh, this would be really nice to do this. And I'm thinking, maybe she'll forget about that. <laughs> and she's so good. She doesn't nag me at all. But at this Christmas, after about a year, her saying, you know what, it would be nice for us to do this because it would be a cool improvement. I wrote her a little note after giving her some gift for Christmas, and I said, I'm going to take care of that desire you have, that surprise, and I'm going to make sure that you get that, and I'll take care of it. I'll get it done. Had to do with some painting and also some trim work, some major trim work that had to be done in the foyer area, and I said, okay, we'll get to it. And we did it, and it looks good. But here's the thing. You have one of those projects. You go, oh, I just don't want to do it. Who's Larry the Cable Guy? Come on, tell me. There you go. Get her done. Get her done. You're like, man, it's in the back of my mind. I got to get to this. I have to get her done. I have to get working on this. And I just keep putting it off. I just procrastinate. And Paul is saying to Titus, get her done. (laughs) Here is a major project. And you know, he trusts him because Titus was probably led to Christ by Paul. And then discipled by him, he becomes his apprentice. And he also tests him in many different ways, puts him involved in different ministries. And Titus proves faithful, and now this is his greatest test. Go back and get those churches where they need to be. Because Paul and Titus went there after his second missionary, after his, actually, his second imprisonment when he was in Rome. And so he goes there, and he says, look, at this The churches are in trouble. They need help. And so he leaves Titus there to take care of it. So we want to look at this. And when you think about the idea of getting get her done, think about your own faith. Think about your own life and your relationship with God. Think about our church. And here's the big idea. Be established in your faith through healthy habits. Be established in your faith through healthy habits. Now, as most of you know, my wife and I, we moved down here in September of 2020, and God led us together. I thought I'd come down here and retire, you know, take a break as a pastor, and God had other ideas. Well, I was in New York. I had a regiment of certain things I did to stay in shape. I played basketball on Monday nights with a bunch of guys and rode my bike. When I say that, I have to clarify it's not, a, it's not a motorcycle. It is a bicycle. I rode my bicycle to stay in shape so many miles a week. And I come down here, and that's all taken away. And I'm like, man, the food is so good. Oh, my goodness. And literally, this is true. Within uh, working here about a month, I mean, we're going to different places. And the barbecue. Now, I know what I'm talking about now when I say barbecue, Okay. <laughs> Some of you know that when I first came down here, barbecue to New York is hot dogs and hamburgers, okay? Forgive me. And here's why. I mean, you got the barbecue places everywhere, and they're good. In Syracuse, there was one barbecue place. I mean, you're looking at me like, I'm going to check that out. Well, maybe now there's maybe more, but there was called Dinosaur Barbecue. And if you wanted to impress somebody with good barbecue, that's the only place you went. Talk about a monopoly. Wow, that's crazy. Down here, there seemed like, you know, they're everywhere. Deep fried food, I'm telling you, it takes work to be healthy, doesn't it? Wow. But we need to get her done. So we need healthy habits, and the first one is active faith. This is the first healthy habit for the believer and for the church to have active faith. James says, if our faith is not active, it's what? Dead faith. It's dead. It's dead. 
Titus chapter 1, verses 1 to 4 says this, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect, that's God's people, and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness in the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time, in which now at his appointed season has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior, to Titus, my true son, in our common faith. Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Now think about this. He emphasizes the idea of faith. There's different aspects of faith for the believer. And here I want to talk about, first of all, the idea of saving faith. You really can't get started in the Christian life, obviously, without having saving faith. You absolutely need. And for years, as you know, I grew up in a non-Christian home, started attending a church, and I had faith in God, period. I didn't have saving faith. Until that day, as a high school senior, I stepped across the line, trusted Christ, and had saving faith. That's the beginning place. If you don't know Christ, you need saving faith. He says when you have saving faith, God gives you the hope of eternal life because God can't lie. That is a promise. And that word hope doesn't mean, well, I hope you get it. You know, like somebody may say, I hope to get to that project someday. That's not what the Greek means. It means a confident expectation of what has not been realized yet. He's got this amazing full realization of eternal life that starts the moment of salvation but will be fully realized when you see Christ. And God's promised that. If you don't know Christ, you're missing out. People need to hear this good news from us, from believers. In Romans 10, verse 14, and many times I've heard this used of missionaries. It's true, but it's not just true of missionaries. You see, God has called every single believer to be a missionary, even if it is a missionary to the supermarket. Listen to what he says. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Guess what? That is our job description for every believer. God says we are to bring the gospel to people who don't know Christ. It's for all Christians. I remember (laughs) in upstate New York as a pastor, a young pastor, many times people would come to me and say, I've got a a family member or a brother or a sister or a relative that needs Jesus. Can you come and talk to them? And I felt like saying, can't you you have the gospel? Tell them. (laughs) Of course, many times I would oblige, but think about that. You, as a believer, have the good news. It's in you. When you come to faith in Christ, you have this relationship that you can tell others about. We're doing Invite Your One again, starting the end of April. And I want to challenge you as a church and challenge you to begin praying for people that you go, I want to invite that person to come to this church and check out what God's doing here. So begin thinking about that. Begin praying about it. You see, churches, healthy churches, one aspect of a healthy church, active faith, is the idea that we are healthy in the sense that we're maturing, we're growing, but we're also reproducing. We're finding people, helping them come to Christ, get baptized. If you haven't been baptized, May 15th, we've got a couple guys getting baptized. There's a chance. We're having a dinner. What do they call it? Potluck? I call it a dish to share. Bring a dish to share. That's going to be a lot of fun. But a church that's healthy is reproducing not only, not only new people coming to Christ, people coming to Christ, but also reproducing itself. Think about that. I've said this before. All of life reproduces except for the American church. All of life reproduces except for the American church. It's so easy for the American church to think we want bigger, better, more. We just want to think about us and not think about, wait a minute, there's a need right over in this town that needs a new gospel preaching church. Let's do something about it. Beginning of March, I went on a pastor's retreat sponsored by Seacoast Church. In fact, they paid the whole thing for pastors. There were 12 of of us. They do this on a regular basis. 
I mean, this was in a mansion that was on John's Island, right on the waterfront. I mean, we felt like kings. They served us. They provided food. They even had pro fishing guides, which really helps for me, okay? They had two ponds that were stocked with, with bass, and they had these little pontoon, mini pontoon boats that were electric. All you had to do is push the pedals, you know, go forward, push the pedals down, go back, et cetera. And I went with a pro fishing guide. He was an, actually a bass pro, and you should have seen his kayak, he says, oh, yeah, for that kayak, I spent like seven grand. Yeah, it's, and, and that's just for the kayak. All the electronics, it goes, the whole thing's about 25 grand. Because he's a, he's a pro. This is what he does for a living. And he was so good at teaching us how to fish. I mean, I've fished since I was a little boy, but he was teaching us <laughs> and showing us. He goes, okay, there's a lot of weeds and trees right there. We got a weedless lure. Just throw it. And I'm going, it's going to get snagged. And he goes, no, just keep reeling it. You got to hit the shore and go through the shallow water because the bass are spawning right now. And, man, he's pulling them in left and right, and I got a couple. But he said it's in their DNA. It's in their DNA to do this. It's who they are. Let that become us as a church. Let it become part of us, who we are as a church, to say it's in our DNA to see people come to Christ, to get baptized. And when God leads us to start a church over in this area, wherever that is, so we can see other people come to Christ. You say, well, we're in the Bible Belt. We've talked about that. Kannapolis is called the pocket of darkness by the Southern Baptists because people are attending church less and less and less. There's a lot of buildings. Less and less people attending church. Pray for us as a church. Where we've, there's an open door in the area of Amity Hill. We're planning to start a Bible study there. Let's see what happens with that. Let's see what God does. Living faith. Not only do you need saving faith, but as Jordan said, man, good job last, last week. Where's Jordan? I know he's here somewhere. Good job, a good job last week, and talking about the idea that we don't just get saved and that's it. We have living faith. God wants us to have living faith. He wants our faith to be active. In Romans chapter 1, verse 17, it says this, For, the, for in the gospel, the good news, Jesus came from heaven to earth. God comes from heaven to earth, takes on human flesh. This is the gospel lives a perfect life, dies on the cross, rises again. That's the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. From the moment you come to Christ, right, you have the righteousness of God in you. That's your position, just as it is written. The righteous, those people who know Christ, will live by faith. We're always being tested to trust God to trust his word. We're seeing gas prices go up. <laughs> we can do, we, we got a choice, right? We can whine and complain. We can say, oh, woe is me. Who knows where it's going to go? God knows. He wants us to trust him. He wants us to praise him no matter what happens. I was a new believer. I was going to Bible college. I'd come home for summer break. And I didn't even have a car yet. And I remember <laughs> my poor dad, I was always taking his truck, or truck, right? How do I say it? Truck. <laughs> I got a truck. But, and I'm sometimes, you know, I was working, but it was summer job. I wasn't making a ton of money. And I was like, Dad, can I borrow $5 for gas? This was back, some of you may remember this, this was back in the 70s. When there was a gas shortage. You remember that? And the price of gas, I remember watching it go up. It doubled over the summer. Interest rates went to 21%. You said, oh, I was doing good until you started talking about this. But I was a new believer. You know what? I did not let it distract me from sharing my faith. Because people were wondering, what, what's, what's happening? 
God has placed us where he's placed us. Not to whine and complain about the world changing and things happening, but to be a witness for him, having living faith, being open to the Holy Spirit's work in us. So that's the question. Are you open? Are you open to what the Holy Spirit's doing in your life? As a church, we, we need to be open to what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. Be open to his movement. We have a cool thing coming up at Easter. Rise up. You're going, oh, that's for children. But we need workers. We need helpers. If you are available on April 16th, sign up. Sign up at member services. Sign up to help because they're going to do this really amazing portrayal of Jesus' death and resurrection. There's all these different stations that kids are going to be able to go through. Actually, full families will be able to go through and experience. And if you have friends that you know, don't go to church anywhere or are interested, bring them. This is a great event. Sign up for it. Participate. So you need, we need active faith. The next thing is godly character. Titus was challenged by Paul to go to these leaders, go to these churches and say, hey, you need to have godly character. Someone once said it, character really is who are you when no one's looking? Who are you when no one's looking? And God, through Paul, gave Titus a job. That was his assignment. And the reason, he says in verse 5, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town. And the, the, the word there, put in order, is where we get the word orthodontics. What does an orthodontic person, what does an orthodontist do? Straighten teeth. Now we have four children. Some of them needed orthodontic work, okay? They needed braces. Here Paul is saying to Titus, these churches need to be straightened out. They need your help. Get them in order so they can be mature. What is in your life that you say, ooh, that needs to be straightened out? (laughs) Well, how's God tugging at your heart? What's lacking, said unfinished, what's lacking? What area of your life needs work? What do you need to do? Maybe God wants you to serve in some way. Maybe you can step up and as, as Jeff was saying, you know, participate. You know that... We, the band sounds so good. They do, but sometimes they don't have all the musicians that they need. Maybe you as a drummer can help out. They need a drummer sometimes. Or child care, help out in that area. He tells them to appoint elders in every town, as I directed you. Our church has elders. We have three pastors. We have elders that helps us work together, become a team Keeps us on track. But, you know, you have to find your place as well. Because not everybody's going to be a leader. Some people have to be followers. My mom, used to, my mom used to say, when there would be too many people in the kitchen, too many chefs spoil the soup. She's like, get out, I'm cooking here. You need leaders and you need followers. And Paul says to Titus, he says this, In chapter 1, verses 6 to 8, he gives a job description. This is daunting. An elder must be blameless. doesn't mean perfect. It means the idea that they're keeping short accounts. Faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe. The idea of being faithful, not necessarily believers, because how are you going to do that when they're little? And are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless. Not overbearing, which means selfishly stubborn. I got to have my way. Not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent. I mean, he's talking to Titus like, hey, you got some problems on this island here. This is what you're going to face. Not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. And these are the goals for leaders because God wants to move his church in this way. God desires for his church 
to have godly leaders, and I believe we have those. I, I'm so thankful for the pastors and the elders. The sad part is that many churches in America put bigger emphasis on the communication. Hey, the guy's got to be a great preacher. Don't worry about his, his, his beliefs. We started our second church in 2005. This is way back up in Syracuse, and there were some young guys in that, in that group, and they kept saying to me, man, you got to listen to this guy. He's really good. Read some of his books. So I did. And I had question marks like, wait a minute, something's not quite right with his, his ideas. But they said, man, he can really communicate. And man, was he good. He could really communicate. He was an amazing orator. I watched some of his numas. I listened to him online, etc. Well, maybe not online because it was before all that, but. I listened to the DVDs, and then I started having questions about this guy. His name's Rob Bell. Some of you may know who I'm talking about. And then he wrote a book, Love Wins. In the book, he totally denied the idea that people who don't know Christ are going to suffer eternal separation from God. He said, everybody's going to heaven. I said, that's it. I'm done. I'm not listening to him anymore. You see, it's so important for us to be able to look at what the Scripture says and base our leadership, which we have, on what God's Word says. 1 Timothy 4.16 says, Watch your life and your doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. It's a daunting task to be a pastor in a church because God says that we are managers of his household. That word means steward. So in a, steward, a stewardship situation or a manager, how much do they actually own? When we say stewardship, how much does that person own? None of it. And a manager of a company just manages what's going on. And so he's saying here, that elders, pastors, overseers are managing God's flock because Jesus owns us. We belong to him. He died for us. We are to manage what he has given us. And here's my challenge to you. If you're not a church leader here, be a good follower. In, in Romans 15, verse 30, this is how one of the ways you can support your leadership. Romans 15, verse 30. Listen to what Paul calls out and asks the people to do for him. This is what we're calling for. I urge you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. That's what we ask. Pray for us. We absolutely need your prayers. We want to know how God wants to lead our church. We want to know if we're doing the right things, how we're ministering to you, how we're reaching out to the community. Just pray. Pray for us as leaders. Pray that we would have wisdom from God. We wouldn't be doing this on our own. So we need active faith to stay healthy. We need godly character. We also need healthy doctrine. Verse 9, he says, he must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. That word sound, we get the word for hygiene. So what does that word hygiene mean? What does hygiene mean? Cleanliness, right? Paul is saying they need healthy doctrine, doctrine that is based on the scriptures, doctrine that is clean. It's not filled with all sorts of crazy ideas of man-made religion, but it comes from God's word. It comes from God's word. It says, according to the doctrine, which the message as it has been taught. In other words, Paul received it right from Jesus. The apostles received it from Jesus while he was on earth. Paul had that special revelation, and they passed it on. And the New Testament is what we have. We are so blessed to have it in writing for us. And that word for sound doctrine is used nine times in the pastoral epistles. Nine times. Paul is 
saying in, in First and Second Timothy and Titus, he's saying, this is so important. You and I need healthy doctrine because if you have doctrine that's wrong, guess what it's going to do to your character? It's going to be messed up. If you have a doctrine that says, well, if I'm not sure God will save me. Um, I have to work for it. That's wrong doctrine. Or once you come to faith in Christ, you go, well, I need to keep working to keep my salvation. That's wrong doctrine because Jesus keeps you. Or I've got to perform to please God, and God loves you. He says, I love you with an everlasting love. You don't have to perform to impress me. Just do it because you love me. So we need God's word. And he says here, so that we can encourage others. The word encourage means to kind of wrap your arm around somebody. And I see it happening all around our church when somebody's struggling, when somebody's going through deep waters, somebody's hurting deeply. we got the grief share. Man, that is so amazing. Kathy and Dean Bruce pulling that off and putting it together. That is so amazing. Maybe you're hurting in some way. Get into that. But this word means to wrap your arm on somebody and just, just love on them, encourage them. But it also means to exhort them. When I was a new pastor, I got out of seminary, went into my home church as an intern. There was a pastor there that, my, my pastor, that basically wrapped his arm around me and just basically coached me, and I would call him weekly on the phone to say, hey, I need help. <laughs> I don't know what in the world to do in this situation. This is craziness. And he's like, this is what you should do. This is what you've done. You know, pray about it, but here's, here's a way to approach that situation. And he continued to be an encouragement to me. And throughout ministry, God's always placed those people. A year ago in August, we heard a guy named Doug. He spoke. He is a guy that constantly calls me. He and I were up in Syracuse together. He's down here. He was at the pastor's retreat. He was an encourager, someone that exhorts. He doesn't call me and go, hey, how are things going? And then when I whine about something, he doesn't go, okay. No, he goes right after my heart and says, why? Why are you complaining about that? What's wrong with you? <laughs> Why don't you work on this? That's encouragement. God tells us to do that. Encourage one another daily as long as it's called today. Verse 10, for there are many rebellious people full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. Not only do we need to hold the doctrine, but share it. You need to know God's word, but you also need to share it. Tell other people what's on your heart. Tell other people what you're learning in God's word and be able to share it, not in a braggadocious way, but in a way that says, man, this is what God's teaching me. Because there are people out there, Paul says, on this island especially, that are rebelling against authority, that are buying into deception, and we need to help them, not because we're better and when he says the circumcision group, he's talking about the religious crowd, the Jews who are legalists, who are basically saying, you've got to stick to the law plus grace, and that's not possible. Verse 11, they must be silenced. That means to put a gag in their mouth. <laughs> because they're disrupting whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. One of the Cretes' own prophets has said, and we read this earlier, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. This saying is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply. And that, that word sharply is used of a knife. Cutting, cutting. So that they will be sound in the faith. They will pay no attention to Jewish myths or Merely human commands of those who reject the truth. So let me ask you this. If you're going to learn sound doctrine, how are you going to learn it? Is it going to just be Sunday morning? Is it going to be in just a life group? I hope that happens. I hope you get into a life group and really develop relationships there. And, and that's really what life groups are about, is building relationships, getting to know each other, and learning God's word and praying together. But you also need to learn it on your own. Boy, in, in America today... We are so blessed with the many, many different ways we can get God's word. Now, you think about Titus. In his day, Paul is sending a letter 
from one of his helpers to Titus while Titus is working on the island. He's got this letter. Those other people on the island, the Christians, they didn't have that letter. We don't know how much of the New Testament they had at that time. A lot of their teaching was oral. A lot of their teaching was passing on through oral transmission, just talking to each other until later on the New Testament was put together. So you and I have paper copies. We have digital versions. There's really no excuse to get into the Word. You're going, I don't know, you know, you carry your phone around, and maybe you have more time for news feeds than the good news. Get it on your phone. Put the good, there's a great Bible app called YouVersion. Put it on your phone and set up a Bible reading plan so you can get into the Word and hear God's Word, hear God speak to you on a regular basis. God's moved me to kind of do some exploring into a period of time when I came to Christ in the, in the 70s. It's, it actually takes place before the 1970s. I've read a, a couple of real, I talked about this a couple of weeks ago about the Jesus Revolution. It was a revival that started in California, moved all the way across the country. There's a book that I'm reading now called God's Forever Family. And it's referring to what happened in the 60s before the revival took place in the early 70s. And it's a cool story. It's all these hippies, all these bohemians. You know, a bohemian is a person that says, I can do whatever I want. These people were involved in in experimental drugs and taking (laughs) reds and (laughs) uppers and LSD and just looking for their next high and all sorts of other crazy things. He tells a story in this book about a guy named Ted Wise who was a hippie, who was involved in drugs and all sorts of crazy other things that happened in the the 60s. They say if if you're old enough to remember the 60s, you weren't there. That's what they say. But this, this young man met a Baptist pastor and started attending the Baptist church. This is in the 60s. This is in California. This is near, like, Los Angeles area. His ways, because he showed up just the way he was, long hair, big old beard, crazy hippie clothes, many times without shoes, and he wanders into the Baptist church, and they're going, whoa, you need to clean up your life before you come in here. And he was... He was shocked. This new Christian, this guy had come to Christ. He's a new Christian. This guy named Ted, he was shocked at the Christian in his church that spent all their time in church and little time knowing and doing what the Bible actually said. And what does that mean? That means that he was out there sharing his faith with some of these other friends that that were coming to Christ, and there was this little band growing, and he was so passionate about sharing his faith, and he couldn't understand why these Christians had the Bible and were learning it over and over again, and they weren't willing to take it to their friends and their neighbors. And the pastor said this, as quoted in this book, he said, when he read, that's Ted, when he read, He accepted the face value of whatever he read in God's word without resistance. Most refreshing was his readiness to do whatever he understood God to be requiring of him, having no buildup of rationalizing scripture to where it could not get a response. He frequently came up with valid insights which the rest of us would miss. Ted Wise and his friends had trouble understanding how long-time self-professed Christians could read the Bible and be unmoved by Christ's teaching. So missed the point of Scripture and had no interest in sharing the gospel with people outside of Christ. Don't let that be true of us. Don't let that be true of you or me as Christians. We have the greatest message ever, the good news. The last healthy habit is loving concern. Titus chapter 1, verse 15, it says, To the pure, all things are pure. He's talking about people who come to faith in Christ. God has forgiven you all your sins. 
He has forgiven every single one. Colossians tells us that. That's our position. Now we need to walk in that purity. That's our responsibility. When the Holy Spirit says, hey, that's not good, <laughs> deal with that. That's confession and turning away from it. 1 John 1.7 says this, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. There's no perfect Christian, believe me. But God wants us to walk in fellowship with him and with one another. I love to hear about life groups. And there are some, you know, I don't know how many Jeff takes care of that, but there are a number of life groups and there's, I hear these stories, and it's so neat to hear the health of the life groups and how they're taking care of each other, praying together, and they're going to you know, dinner together. And that's so awesome. That's such a great thing, and that's what we want. We want to multiply life groups, build those relationships. And if you're not in a life group, get, sign up, join up. But there's also people in our church that come from time to time that don't know Christ. It's not, our, it's not for us to go, oh, well, they don't know Jesus. I'm not going to reach out to them. No, we need to love them as well. He says, but to those who are corrupted, and he's just talking about the fact that they don't have forgiveness, that they haven't been washed. They haven't received forgiveness because they haven't trusted Jesus. They do not believe. I remember attending church as a teenager, just hoping that I could earn my way to heaven, which was a lie. So I put my total trust in Christ. Both their minds and consciences are corrupted. They claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him. Detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. They can't work their way to heaven because sin is stopping them. They need to trust in Christ. We love them as well. We have a saying. We want them to belong before they believe. We want them to be a part and ask questions. We've seen this happen with numerous people where they come to church. They come to a life group. They ask questions. They talk to others. And the next thing you know, they go, hey, I know Christ now, and I want to get baptized. Second Timothy chapter 2 says this, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. Don't argue with people who don't know you. Share the gospel, share the truth, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, lead, grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. That's our job. Share the gospel, not cram it down somebody's throat. Loving people. So when you think of this message, what are you lacking? What is it in your life? What is it that God's tugging at your heart saying, get it done? Or I should say, get her done. What is it? You're going, man, this is not right. I need to work on this. Are you someone who doesn't know Christ and you need to trust in Christ? As Romans 10, 17 says, For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Maybe you need to trust Christ. Maybe you need to go, you know what? I want to respond. I need to just open my heart to Christ. I need to put my total trust in him and stop trying to earn my way. That's why it's good news, because he did the work. Or maybe, as a believer, you really haven't been living by faith. He says the righteous will live by faith. I quoted Larry the Cable Guy, and for years he was making lots of money not doing what God wanted. His story goes like this. He was raised in a preacher's home in Nebraska, by the way. They traveled to Florida. His father was a principal of a Christian school he was running from God, running, 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 making money, doing his own thing. And in 2014, in his testimony, he rededicates his life to Christ. He surrenders and says, okay, I want to do what you want, God. Maybe that's you. 
Maybe you've been running. You're coming to church, but you're running. You're saying, I don't want to do that, God. I don't want to do what you tell me to do. Just surrender. Surrender. Let's bring the band up, the worship team up. And I want you to think and pray along these lines. What healthy habits do you need? Is one of them that the, the need to listen to the Holy Spirit? That maybe you've just been pushing God out and you've been doing your own thing and you're not listening to him and he's nudging at your heart. You're a believer and you're going, I, I don't know, I'm going to do what I want. God tells us that those who live by the Spirit should keep in step with the Spirit. So ask God, ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, what do you want me to do? What direction do you want me to go in? And we as a church should have the same idea. Lord, what do you want us to do? What do you want us to do? If you don't know Christ, I'm going to give you a chance, even right now, to open your heart to Christ.